Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. In this video, I'm going to talk all about the world energy outlook um, according to the International Energy Agency. Now, in the last video, I talked about um, the oil and gas industry and net zero transitions, you know, and in various scenarios. Um, but this paper, this video today is much more interesting, I think, because, uh, you know, I look at the whole gamut of energy systems. So, um, yeah, it's actually quite a, a uh, lengthy, involved paper, and it's got lots of good uh, information. Now, I'm a day early for the eclipse, but um, what I did is I took some uh, 3D glasses from the movie theater, and then I took my official... Um, sun blocking uh paper you know cheap paper glasses and i cut the arms off and i used uh, electrical tape to tape it on so i have a much more durable set of uh sunglasses eclipse glasses and uh i was walking out wa out walking newton and he wasn't too interested in the eclipse or the sun uh, he was just more interested in chasing squirrels and rabbits, so he kept pulling. You know, it's not recommended that you walk with these things or, you know, have a dog on a leash as you're doing your sun gazing because you have to be very careful, of course, uh, you know, with the sun. But as I was walking along, I could see the sun, you know, the whole disk of the sun. It's smaller than I remember. And, uh, you know, as I continued to walk, I noticed it being blocked and blocked and blocked more, and there was only a tiny sliver left. Then I realized, well, hey, this is not Eclipse Day. I'm the day before. You know, it was my neighbor's roof that was blocking it. So anyway, I got a good trial run with these. Um, so, you know, be very careful if you're uh, watching the Eclipse, if you're in the path. I'm in Ottawa, we're expecting about 98.5% of totality, not quite totality. So I'm going to probably drive down towards the St. Lawrence River, maybe uh, Brock or uh, Prescott or Gananoque, and hopefully it's a clear day. I mean, there's clouds forecast tomorrow for Ottawa, so uh, hopefully it's, it, it's clear. I'll be watching cloud maps and try to find uh, an opening you know, about 2.30 in the afternoon when we're supposed to see it. Okay, so let's talk about the International Energy Agency report, World Energy Outlook 2023. So this is a 355-page report, so I'm not going to cover every page clearly, but I'll cover some of what I think are the key, the key points in this report. Okay. Um, okay. This op it's open source. The links are in the um, the links are in the description. So let's talk about the forward. Okay. So we're fifty years on from the oil shock, right? In the early seventies, seventy two, seventy three, the Arab oil embargo, and the oil shock. You know, that's fifty years ago. That oil shock led to the founding of the International Energy Agency, the IEEA. And once again, we're facing a moment, you know, in 2024 of high geopolitical tensions and uncertainty in the energy sector. There's parallels between now and 1973. Uh, of course, oil was oil supplies were the focus back then amid a crisis in the Middle East. Uh, we also have a crisis in the Middle East, but, you know, and also the Russia, you know, invasion of the Ukraine, but there's key differences. The global energy system has changed considerably since the early 1970s. Further changes are happening rapidly before our very eyes. Okay, so, you know, we basically had a global energy crisis erupting in February 2022 with Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. So the IEA is basically committed to its core mission of safeguarding energy security. So they're starting to take a much bigger interest in renewable energies, um, critical minerals, and, uh, you know, alternative supplies of energy 
you know, because they see the writing on the wall for the fossil fuel industry and also for the methane, the, the, the natural gas bridge, if you like, you know, it was touted as a bridge fuel um, when it took off, you know, a decade or so ago. Okay, so they do this annual report, the World Energy Outlook. Um, so some of the differences between the energy sector 50 years ago and where it is today, the 1973-74 oil crisis, it was all about oil. But today there's pressures from multiple areas, right? We may have fragile oil markets because of the conflicts, but we've seen, uh, so this time we've seen an acute crisis in natural gas markets caused by Russia's cuts to supply and also the um, detonation of the undersea uh, natural gas pipeline. There's strong knock-on effects to electricity generation. Of course, we have an acute climate crisis that's worsening every day. There's increasingly visible effects of climate change caused by the use of fossil fuels including record-breaking heat waves experienced around the world this year. Huge weather whiplashing. Just to give you an idea, uh, a couple of days ago, you know, we had snow here in Ottawa, you know, and it was hovering around zero for several days. Well, today it was 18 degrees Celsius, just a couple of days later. It's getting even hotter. So, you know, these huge um, swings in temperature, um, you know, are part and parcel of climate change. So we've got multiple, uh, you know, today's crisis has multiple dimensions. So we need solutions that are all encompassing. Ultimately, what is required is not just to diversify away from a single energy commodity, but to change the energy system itself and to do so while maintaining affordable and a secure provision of energy services. The growing impacts of global warming make this all the more important as an increasing amount of energy infrastructure that was built for a cooler, calmer climate is no longer reliable or resilient enough as temperatures rise and weather events become more extreme. So basically, we have to transform the entire energy system, both to stave off even more severe climate change and also to cope with climate change that we're already seeing today. So we're talking about mitigation and adaptation. We A second difference between the 1970s and today is we already have the clean energy technologies for the job in hand. The 1973 oil shock was a major catalyst for change, driving a huge push to scale up energy efficiency and nuclear power. You know, it took many years to ramp them up, um, and, you know, today things are totally different. I mean, we have key technologies like wind and solar emerging, increasing like crazy. Um, we're making big gains in efficiency and we're electrifying our transportation grid, cars and buses and trains and all the rest of it. Okay, so it's causing turbulence, uh, you know, in the whole system, turbulence among the traditional technologies, turbulence in the oil and gas industry. Clean energy transitions have real momentum at the moment. You know, in the 1970s, many countries were going from a standing start as they scrambled to respond to the oil shock. But now we've got a lot of international processes and accords in place like the Paris Agreement. Um, and we're, we're ramping up uh, clean energy um, like crazy. You know, in the IEA, the International Energy Agency, you know, people associate it, including myself, just with the fossil fuel industry and oil and gas, but I think they're transitioning uh, to, uh, you know, away from the traditional energy sources to, to new ones. Um, you know, one of their mandates of the IEA, uh, International Energy Agency, is they want to lead the global energy sector's fight against climate change. So. So there you have it, you know, that's what they're saying. Um, so this report is all about the, the um, you know, what's happening, um, at what's happening in, for global energy, energy global wide on a global basis. Okay, um, so let's go to, okay, so basically, um, you know, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna go through fairly quickly to various sections and talk about you know, some of what I see as the key points. 
Okay, so some of the energy immediate, some of the immediate pressures from the global energy crisis have eased, but energy markets, geopolitics, and the global economy are unsettled, and the risk of further disruption is ever present. Okay, uh, because of you know climate change is thrown a wrench in the entire energy markets, and we have to completely retool our systems and go to much cleaner energy. We need a new clean energy economy um, led by solar PV and electric vehicles. Um, and so here's some of the stats here. Um, okay, they, well, they talk about air pollution. The energy sector is the primary cause of the polluted air that more than 90% of the world's population is forced to breathe, linked to more than 6 million, I think it's almost 10 million premature deaths a year. This is just from air, air pollution. So the, what's with the new clean energy economy? Well, investment in clean energy has risen by 40% since 2020. The push to bring down emissions is a key reason, but not the only one. The economic case for mature clean energy technologies is strong. Energy security is also an important factor, particularly in fuel importing countries, as are industrial strategies and the de desire to create clean energy jobs. Not all clean technologies are thriving, and some supply chains, like for wind notably, are under pressure, but we're getting an accelerating pace of change. In a few videos from now, I'll talk all about tipping points in the climate system, and there is such a thing as, as uh, positive or beneficial tipping points, like for example, the clean energy technology revolution. So here's some stats. In 2020, one in 25 cars sold was electric. Okay, that's 4%. In 2023, uh, it's one in five. One in five cars sold in, at the end of 2023 was electric. You know, most of being led by China. I mean, most of those in China, because it's certainly not one in five in Canada, you know, where I am. Um, I don't think it's one in five in North America. More than 500 gigawatts of renewable generation capacity was added in 2023, a new record. More than U.S., more than one billion U.S. dollars a day is being sent, spent on solar development manufacturing capacity for key components of a clean energy system like solar PV modules and EV batteries is expanding fast. Okay, so so those are all uh, good things. Now, in the last video, I, I talked about these different scenarios. So there's three main scenarios that they use, the International Energy Agency uses. One of them is called the Stated Policies Scenario, or STEPS for short. Um, and that's an outlook based on the latest policy settings, including energy, climate, and related industrial policies. So this is what is actually being done. What countries have announced, the announced pledges scenario, it assumes all national energy and climate targets made by governments are met in full and on time. So this isn't happening, but this is the, what countries are pledging. You have to go much beyond this to, for the net zero emissions uh, scenario, net zero emissions by 2050, the NZE scenario. Now it says which limits global warming to 1.5. We know we've already reached uh, that on average for an entire year. Okay, so according to the report, we're on track to see all fossil fuels peak before 2030. So this is uh, good news. Right, a legacy of the global energy crisis may be to usher in the beginning of the end of fossil, the fossil fuel era. The momentum behind clean energy transitions is now sufficient for global demand for coal, oil, and natural gas to all reach a high point before 2030. And that's in the basic scenario that, that of policy that's already been announced and it is being enacted by governments. The share of coal, oil, and natural gas in global energy supply has been stuck for decades at about 80% of the total. It'll start to edge downward, and they project that it will reach 73% uh, in the basic, you know, with pledges already being enacted by 2030. 
This is an important shift. However, if demand for these fossil fuels remains at a high level, as been in the case has been the case for coal in recent years, and as in the case in the steps projections for oil and gas, it's far from enough to reach global climate goals. Okay, so the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA in the United States, is doing is making a difference. It's projecting that 50% of all new U.S. car registrations will be electric in 2030, you know, in the steps in the presently mandated um, objectives that are being enacted, you know, high, high probability of reaching steps. Two years ago, in the, the, the World Energy Outlook report, 2021, that number was 21, was 12 percent rather, and, and it's now two years later, that number is now 50 percent. In the European Union in 2030, heat pump installations in the steps. In this report, it shows that it will reach two thirds of the level needed for the, the net zero emission scenario. That's compared to one third that was projected just two years ago. So the growth is very rapid. In China, projected additions of solar PV and offshore wind to 2030 are now three times higher than they were in the report from two years ago. Uh, prospects for nuclear power have also improved in leading markets. Um, there's support for lifetime extensions of existing nuclear reactors in countries including Japan, Korea, and the U.S., as well as some new, new builds for several more around the world. Although demand for fossil fuels has been strong in recent years, there's signs of a change in direction. So is the boat is slowing down? Will the boat turn around? Uh, you know, this is saying that it will, you know, in the next five, six years, within the next five, six years. Alongside the deployment of low emissions alternatives, the rate of, at which new os assets that use fossil fuels are being added to the energy system has slowed. Sales of cars and two-wheel vehicles, three-wheel vehicles with internal combustion engines are well below where they were before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. In the electricity sector, worldwide additions of coal and natural gas-fired power plants have halved, at least from earlier peaks. Sales of resi residential gas boilers have been trending downwards and are now outnumbered by sales of heat pumps in many countries in Europe and the US. I mean, the heat pump is an amazing technology. China has changed the energy world, of course, but now China is changing. So China has, ha has had an outsized role in shaping global energy trends. This influence is evolving as the economy slows in China and its structure adjusts. Clean energy is growing leaps and bounds in China. So over the past 10 years, China accounted for almost two thirds of the rise in global oil use, nearly one third the increase in natural gas use, and it's been the dominant player in the coal markets. But China's economy is reaching an inflection point so it's had a rapid building out of the country's physical infrastructure, but the scope for further expansion is actually narrowing significantly, right? The country already has a world-class high-speed rail network. Residential floor space per capita is now equal to that of Japan. GDP per capita is much lower, okay? It's the cement and steel industries that are reaching saturation. And China is a clean energy powerhouse. It accounts for about half of the wind and the solar additions and well over half of global EV sales uh, in the last few years. But momentum behind China's economic growth is ebbing. There's greater downside potential for fossil fuel demand if it slows further. So in the scenarios, China's GDP growth averages just under 4% per year to 2030. So that means that the total energy demand would peak around the middle of this decade with robust expansion of clean energy, putting overall fossil fuel demand and emissions into decline. If China's near term growth were to slow by another percentage point, this would reduce 2030 coal demand by an amount almost equal to the volume currently consumed by the whole of Europe. So it really depends on China. Oil import import volumes would decline by 5%, LNG more than 20%. That's just with a percent decline in the Chinese uh, growth rate. 
Okay, so the end of the growth era for fossil fuels does not mean an end to fossil fuel investment, but it undercuts the rationale for any increase in spending. Okay, so, you know, in order, it, you got to slow down the spending and then decrease it. Um, okay, so, so it's interesting that the, the global peaks in demand for each of the three fossil fuels coal, oil, and gas, each is expected to peak independently and then start dropping within the next five or six years, according to, to, to their best knowledge in this report. The drivers for growth and demand for energy services in most emerging and developing economies is very strong. Rates of urbanization, built space per capita, ownership of air conditions and vehicles are far lower uh, than in advanced economies. Um, you know, they're projecting the global population to grow by about 1.7 billion by 2050. That's a huge growth rate, you know, still growing by the gangbusters. So uh, they talk about electrification, improvements in efficiency, a switch to lower and zero carbon fuels being key levers available to emerging and developing economies to reach their national energy and climate targets. Okay, uh, they give some examples. They say that renewables, they say there's ample global manufacturing capacity um, and that offers considerable upside for solar photovoltaic. Renewables are set to contribute 80% of new power capacity to 2030 in the, in, the, in the basic scenario. Solar PV alone would account for half of that. But it uses, but this is still using only a fraction of the world's potential. Right, solar has become a major global industry and it's set to transform electricity markets, you know, with the policies in place now. But there's significant scope for further growth given manufacturing plans and the competitiveness of the technology, the cheapness of the technology. By the end of the decade, the world could have manufacturing capacity for more than 1,200 gigawatts of panels per year. But in the step scenario, only 500 gigawatts is deployed globally. So we could do more than double. We could go, we could, we could double it. We could go, you know, double would be a thousand. We could, we could uh, go up by, you know, 1.4 times or, or, or 2.4 times rather. If my math is correct. Um, Right, so we need to expand, strengthen, and strengthen grids and add storage to integrate the additional solar PV into electricity systems and maximize its output. The manufacturing is highly concentrated for solar PV. China is already the largest producer of the solar panels. Its expansion plans far outstrip those in other countries. Right, so trade uh, is going to continue to be vital to support the worldwide deployment of solar since China is the one that is producing by far the most. If we were to get the net zero emission scenario, 70% of that would be from the solar PV, um, basically in, in the models. You know, they, they looked at, um, you know, the implications to China, to the, to the world, and to different places. And basically, solar PV can, can do the job. Uh, they talk about the wave of new LNG export projects starting in 2025. An unprecedented surge in new liquid, liquefied natural gas projects is set to tip the balance of markets and concerns about natural gas supply. Okay, so they're going gung-ho on that. Um, but, you know... Um, they're also saying the, the additional LNG arrives at an uncertain moment for natural gas demand because it's been slashed in Europe, right? Because of the lack of supply and they've tried to switch to other things as quickly as possible. It creates major difficulties for Russia's diversification strategy towards Asia. So the tense situation in the Middle East is a reminder of hazards in oil markets a year after Russia cut supply, gas supplies to Europe. The global energy crisis is, was not a clean energy crisis, but it has focused attention on the importance of ensuring rapid, people-centered, and orderly 
transition. So there's three interlinked issues, the risks to affordability, the electricity security, and the resilience of clean energy supply chains. Okay, so they talk about diversification and innovation as being the best strategies to manage supply chain dependencies for clean energy tech and critical minerals. And I'll, I'll show you some curves on that. So, you know, a range of strategies are in place to strengthen the resilience of clean energy supply chains and reduce today's high level. Today we have high levels of concentration. There's only two or three countries that produce the vast bulk of the particular um, mineral that's needed for the for the clean energy revolution. So that some of the critical minerals are lithium, cobalt, nickel, and rare earths. Copper's in there too. The top three producers are producing way more than the rest. So this is uh, this is a risk. Um, China's holding half of planned lithium chemical plants. Indonesia represents nearly 90% of planned nickel refining facilities. Okay, so we don't have diversification in the critical minerals. So this has to change. Uh, we need to go much further and faster, but a fragmented world from geopolitical conflict, it will not rise to meet our climate and energy security challenges. You know, you can, you, everybody has a plan until they're punched in the mouth. So, you know, that applies here. I mean, the, the world has a plan, but, you know, the wars and the conflicts uh, is, you know, putting those plans in question. Okay, uh, no country is an energy island. No country is insulated from the risks of climate change. The, necess the necessity of collaboration has never been higher, especially in today's tense times. Governments need to find ways to safeguard cooperation on energy and climate including by embracing a rules-based system of international trade, spurring innovation and tech transfer. Okay, the outlook uh, for energy security will look perilous if we lose the benefits of interconnected and well-functioning energy markets to ride out unexpected shocks. Okay, so, um, you know, so these are some key, um, key factors and, uh, you know, uh, so there's overviews, there's lots of stuff about volatility of energy markets and uh, global conflicts and so on. But let's move on. Let's, uh, so solar PV is lighting a path forward for clean energy transitions. So here's where we were in 2015. We were, the, this is what was being produced and this was the capacity. So we were only producing, at, you know, that's about uh, just over 40% of what we, of capacity on solar PV. 2022, you know, we're producing 220 gigawatts, a huge growth uh, with an even bigger growth in capacity. So fourfold growth, uh, over four times growth in what we're producing and uh, over five times increase in manufacturing capacity. Here's where we need to be in 2030. And this is in, this is the steps scenario. So countries are, are actually doing this. So there's some hope that this will actually be achieved. You know, more than two and a half times increase basically in what's being produced. Um, lots in China, advanced economies, other emerging markets, so all over. And the capacity is more than doubled again. Okay. Uh, LNG export projects are going to overturn the gas markets. This is a total capacity uh, increase in the natural gas from liquefied natural gas being shipped around the world. Of course, you know the big concern is if you get a if you get a an accident and a liquefied natural gas tank uh, sinks or whatever, all that gas will heat up and the, the, there'll be explosions from the the uh, ship. It won't be cooled. And it'll it'll gasify, and that methane will go up into the atmosphere, causing a big spike. As China's demand grows slow, as clean energy pushes fossil fuels into decline, so clean energy is on the rise in 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 uh, China, and fossil fuels is actually projected to drop as China's economy slows. Okay, so um, so basically, they look at all of these sort of ideas. Um, anyway, let's uh, move on. Okay, this is fossil fuel consumption. Okay, so this is important. 
I don't know if I should just stay in this mode. Um, so this is fossil fuel consumption by fuel in the basic scenario that's been pledged, um, you know, up so far, this is and projected out to 2050. Oil, you know, this is a COVID dip and, uh, you know, peaking just before 2030. Coal, COVID dip, you know, peaking about, peaking about now or a couple year or two ago. And then a, a sharp drop, mostly by the the China because of China, and then uh, you know um, natural gas, you know peaking about the same time as oil, and then dropping off. So this is in the the most basic uh, steps scenario. We have to go much further, but this is what the uh, projections projections are showing. Um, let's go. Maybe I'll just leave it on that mode. This is global coal demand by sector and, and annual average change by region in the step scenario. Um, so we have, this is the power, coal demand for generating power in coal-fired power plants is the green, you know, peaking, peaking about now. This is the coal that's being used in steel, so metallurgical coal, you know, high-grade coal to get the high temperatures in blast furnaces. This is coal demand for the cement industry, and these are other things that it's being used for. So all basically peaking, uh, peaking now or very soon. And it shows the growth in China. Look at China, 2010 to 2022, big growth uh, and, and big drop uh, 2022 to 2030, and also uh, even bigger drop by 2050. Um, other, the, the EMDE are emerging market and developing economies. AE is advanced economies. And this is million tons of coal equivalent. Okay, so big drops in coal. I talk about oil, the end of the ice age turns prospects around. Okay, and ice stands for internal combustion engine. In the past two decades, oil demand has surged by 18 million barrels per day. Um, that's in 20 years, about a million barrels per day increase per year. Much of the increase has been driven by rising demand in road transport. The global car fleet expanded by more than 600 million cars over the last 20 years. Road freight activity has increased by almost 65%. So road transport now accounts for about 45% of global oil demand, which is far more than any other sector. The petrochemical sector, you know, chemical breaking down oil to make diff different chemicals, that's the second largest consumer of oil, and that's only 15%. So that's only a third of the road transport oil usage. The astounding rise of electric vehicle sales is now having an impact on demand for oil and road transport. So sales of gasoline and diesel cars, two, three wheelers and trucks peaked. So peaked in. So sales of gasoline cars peaked in 2017. Sales of diesel cars peaked in 2018. Sales of two and three wheelers and trucks peaked in 2019. Okay, EVs accounted for 4% of global car sales in 2020. They're on track to reach 18%. So we're at basically 18% in 2023. 14 million EV sales, mostly in China and the advanced economies, and that's set to increase rapidly in the future. Sales of internal combustion engine buses also peak by the mid 2020s uh, with the uptake of electric buses rising particularly quickly in emerging market and developing economies. By the end of this decade, road transport is no longer a source of oil demand growth. It's, it's um, reduction. Okay, so this shows you passenger vehicles, oil demand of passenger vehicles, you know, COVID dip and peaking, trucks added on to this, non-road transport, and then um, the, all the rest of it. With the average annual change decreasing advanced economies faster than other places, uh, but growth slowing in China, you know, any, any, I mean, China really moves the needle, whichever way it goes.
Natural gas, energy crisis marks the end of the golden age. The golden age of gas was a term coined by the International Energy Agency in 2011. It's nearing an end. Global natural gas use has increased by an annual average of about 2% since 2011, but growth slows uh, to less than 0.4% per year from now until 2030. And this is in existing pledges that are being done, not ambitions. The power and building sectors are today's biggest consumers of natural gas. So the power sector is 39%, mostly peaking plants. You know, you can fire up natural gas plants very quickly to produce electricity to meet the you know, transient demand and then shut it off very quickly. 21% uh, um, of, of total uh, demand is the building sector. We've already seen peaks in natural gas capacity additions for power plants, space heating boilers. Um, okay, so that's peaking. Here's natural gas demand for power. So peaking plants, for add, add on the buildings. Um, this is BCM, billion cubic meters of, of gas. Um, industry and other, and you can see the annual change uh, expected. Okay, um, so a slowdown in the economic growth in China would have huge implications for the energy market. So China's economic growth has been an epoch-making event over the last several decades. It's just gone gangbusters. Since 1995, China accounted for two-thirds of the decline in the global population living in extreme poverty. Its GDP per capita increased more than seven times in that time period. The economy tra was transformed into a globally integrated, innovative industrial powerhouse. So, so here is the growth of China um, in various indicators, GDP way up, energy demand way up, energy related CO2 emissions way up, renewables up significantly. Okay, so this is going to be growing way more and at, at the expense of the uh, oil and fossil fuel industry. Okay. Uh, China's, you know, as far back as 2007, China's Zen Premier warned that the biggest problem with China's economy is that growth is unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and unsustainable. Okay, China's leaders have long acknowledged that its current phase of massive and resource-intensive investment in urbanization, infrastructure, and factories must end. Okay, once they're built, they're built, and they've done a lot of that. So this is investment in the Chinese economy, uh, debts increasing, different sectors. Um, okay, it's starting to tur turn a corner. Um, economic indicators, you know, steel production looks like it probably peaked. Cement production has been dropping, uh, you know, the COVID dip, and this is what the projection is. Working age population, the demographics is changing in China. Fewer people are working age, so they, they use less resources. When they're not working, um, steel production on this curve, okay? Uh, so things are changing in, in China. Things are changing and it will change the, uh, the energy outlook for the entire world, okay? So, you know, there's sensitivities. Uh, let's just look at the plots here. I won't talk about them all. Global solar module manufacturing and solar PV capacity. So here's where we have been, this curve, and this is what we're, we're projected to go up to 1,200 gigawatts of production of solar PV and stay above that rate. Okay, so that's the plan. Um, here's solar module exporters. China is exporting, you know, almost 1,000 gigawatt or terawatt. Southeast Asia, it dwarfs all of the other countries, Southeast Asia and India are down here. You know, you, all the other countries are smaller. Here's the US solar module importers. They're importing over 40 gigawatts, European Union, not quite 20, rest of world about 30. That's by 2030, that's projections. So solar manufacturing is set to expand in more than a dozen countries. China remains the largest exporter the European Union and the US remain the major importers. Okay, so anyway, this report is chock full of information. This is solar PV 
and battery capacity, uh, power sector, CO2 emissions uh, dropping, uh, solar PV, coal-fired electricity generation, Uh, global renewable power capacity. Okay, so I'm just going to skip through a bunch because I clearly, I just, I just want to tweak your interest in this report. Uh, so I'm going to look at some, I'll be very specific. Cost of producing steel, global electricity demand. Um, okay, they're looking at hydrogen production. I mean, that's one of the things that the the fossil fuel companies, they, they, uh, if they can't produce the fossil fuels, they, they're thinking that hydrogen can replace it and you can generate hydrogen by electrolysis. You can run buses and things. When, hydrogen, when you combust hydrogen, you just get uh, water out the tailpipe, basically. Water vapor, no emissions. Okay, but you have to spend energy to produce the hydrogen. So you need clean electricity to do that. Um, Okay, so that's one thing that's growing. Uh, this is interesting. I do want to show you this. This is a demand for critical minerals for selected clean electricity supply and electrification technologies. Okay, so this is, uh, here we are in 2022 for copper. Okay, so grids is a light purple. Uh, the green is electric vehicles, right? Pretty small. Low emissions generation. This is solar PV, copper for solar PV, and solar for the wind industry. This is what the projections to 2030, you know, huge amount of growth in copper needed. So here it's about, you know, five megatons of copper. It's more than, it's going up about two and a half times by 2030. Um, and, you know, with big growth of wind, big growth of solar PV, um, some growth in other low emissions generation, huge growth in the grids expansion, battery storage, still small component, electric vehicles is a fast growing chunk. This is silicon um, in megatons. So it's used for solar PV, right? The crystalline silicon. And uh, here's a big growth of silicon. It's also used uh, partly in, you know, parts in electric vehicles. Rare earth elements, this is kilotons, you know, a huge increase for wind and also for, for um, electric vehicles. And then lithium, of course, lithium for batteries. So this is electric vehicles, batteries, battery storage, like big battery storage, not in electric vehicles. And look at the huge growth in lithium. Okay, so these uh, key minerals, um, we're going to, you know, we have to find sources. Um, and uh, let's, uh, I, I want to go to show you where those minerals, what countries those minerals come from. Okay, so this is an interesting plot. This is the average market size and the level of geographical concentration for the extraction of selected uh, commodities. Okay, so this is a market share by the top three producer countries of oil. The market share, the market size is, this is in billions of US dollars, so a thousand billion, a trillion US dollars, you know, oil and natural gas. You know, three companies control between 40 and, you know, about 40 and 45 percent of the supply of oil and natural gas, three top, three countries rather. Look at copper, okay, the market size is pretty big compared, you know, it's, it's bigger than all these others. Um, and it's about 45% of copper is produced in three countries. Nickel, it's slightly smaller market than copper, 60%. So as we go to these rare things, they're, get, they're, they're getting more and more concentrated in fewer in only in, in, in only the top three producer countries. So 60% of nickel is produced in the top three uh, in only three countries. Cobalt, you know, almost 80% of cobalt is produced in just three countries. The rare earth elements, 85 to 86%. Lithium, almost 90% 
of lithium comes from three, three to the three top producer countries and platinum, you know, for electrodes and things over 90%. So this is a huge concentration of key, um, of key commodities in just a few countries. So this is very, very risky for supply chains. The markets for critical minerals are smaller and more concentrated than those of traditional hydrocarbon resources. Okay, so this is very, very key. Um, so they talk about a, a low trust world. You know, if you have a low trust world and lots of geopolitical conflict, then there could be huge supply chain issues. Um, it goes, uh, so let's have a look. They, they have these cool investment flows. So this is kind of neat um, in different countries in the globe. So you can see oil, the oil trajectory, a dip. You can see the increasing low emissions power, natural gas dipping, energy efficiency, a big factor, electricity grids and battery storage on the rise, coal, you know, very small rise, electrification, small, but it's, it's growing faster and faster. So, and then that's uh, segmented into different countries. So it's an interesting way of depicting things. Um, clean energy, fossil fuel. Okay, so there's loads of great information here, but I'm gonna draw to a close here. Price developments for selected energy transition minerals. Uh, this is just in the last couple of years. So lithium spiked, but dropped back a bit. Nickel spiked, spiked again, dropped back. Cobalt spiked, copper pretty, pretty um, constant, but higher than, than the uh, long-term norms. Uh, the average prices, th these are recent cost developments of selected clean energy technologies. So EV batteries, huge gains, right? Huge, huge drop of price. Battery storage down, wind turbines down, solar panels down. Okay, so the price is heading in the right direction for all of these key technologies as we get uh, economies of scale, uh, transformations of the energy system. Uh, these are projections global energy. I think I showed you something similar to this. Global total energy demand by fuel and scenario 2010 to 2050. This is the projections for coal. This is what countries are have promised and are doing. This is if every country did what they promised, this would be the curve. And this is the net zero curve. And they're still trying to reach that magical 1.5 Celsius. You know, that's so for coal, oil, natural gas. And renewables and nuclear, you can see it, uh, you know, going up uh, significantly under these different categories. Not sure why they lump nuclear with renewables, but they do. Um, okay, let's just, all kinds of curves and data. But I think I'm, I need a cold one. So I think I'm going to draw this to an end. Energy demand and aviation, building sector. Okay, so you get the idea. I mean, there's if if you want to really see what's going on in the with the renewable uh, renewable energies, and you know they're all they're all they're heading in the right direction, right? Just are they fast enough? Global hydrogen access to modern energy, right? I mean, it's just, uh, you know, at the very end is uh, all the references, loads of references, okay? And then before the references is the uh, abbreviations and acronyms, loads of those, they love abbreviations and acronyms. And then above that, it's the main, country groupings, you know, that they talk about, and then the definitions of different, uh, you know, key points. So a glossary, and then units, okay, units that are used and what they mean, 
and then information on the different scenarios and detailed charts and stuff. You know, and that's the last 50 pages or so. Okay, lots of tables and stuff to corroborate what they're saying, basically to back up the plots and graphs that they're showing. Okay, so yeah, so anyway, um, it's a very um, detailed, comprehensive report on the present status of our world energy production, where we are right now, fossil fuels, right, the coal, oil, natural gas, expected to all peak um, before 2030, and a huge rapid growth of solar PV, of wind, of electric cars, electrification of grids, and so on. Um, and they talk about what's needed to drive the um, renewable energy growth, you know, the critical minerals, for example, and how they're all concentrated right now um, with the vast majority of the key minerals found in only just a few countries around the world. So a few countries supplying the world. I mean, this is very, this is not the type of supply chain that you want. So if there's a lot of geopolitical threats and, and so on, then, <laughs> you know, there's going to be shortage of these critical minerals and it's going to slow down the clean energy revolution. So anyway, it's still, it's a very useful report to have, have a look at. Um, so I think I've made you aware of it. Please consider going to PayPal and donating to support my research and videos. That's at paulbeckwith.net. Thanks for listening and bye for now.